everybody. Thank you for joining us for the 10th installment of QWR Nature News. My name is Kim and I'm here today with Renee who is off to the left or your right maybe. And then also I would like to introduce um, for the first time ever on QWR Nature News, Cara Fernandez who is our environmental educator here who has been working from home a lot but we're so happy that she can be here today. So I'd like to introduce her, Cara Fernandez. Hi guys. <laughs> All right, and that's it for now. <laughs> but so today and this whole week, we're doing programs in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, so we hope you're enjoying what we've been posting. We're certainly having a good time um, making all of these videos for you guys. Um, and today, um, we want to talk about pollinators and pollination. So I think that's something that's been in the news a lot lately. Um, you know, pollinators like bees, monarch butterflies. Um, so first, I want to talk about just pollination in general. So there are three different types of pollination. Um, and the first one is called anemophily. And anima, the root of that word, means to blow. So that is how, when plants use the wind to transport their seeds from one plant to another. Um, so I think a really good example of that is dandelions. I know that I was always blowing dandelions in the yard, blowing uh, their seeds around, making wishes when I was a kid. My mom did not love that I did that all of the time, but I think that's a great example of that strategy. The second would be zoophily. Um, so if a plant is zoophilus, it relies on animals to transport their seeds from one plant, their pollen from one plant to another. Um, so, uh, the final one, and actually what I want to say about zoophilus is for the terms of this um, lesson, we'll say they're vertebrates. So, um, and there are actually about a thousand uh, vertebrates that are pollinators. So that includes some mammals like bats um, and even some weird mammals like mongoose apparently are pollinators occasionally, deer, rodents, sometimes people, even lemurs. Um, so some animals, animals you might not expect are pollinators. Um, but then there's also birds that are pollinators. And then our last one, which is something completely different, is entomophily. So entomon is um, the root of that word, basically means segmented, which is a reference to the segmented bodies of insects. And insects are our major pollinators. Um, and actually about 75% of flowering plant species rely on either animals or insects to transport their pollen for them. So they're incredibly important. 75% of the world's plants need them. So, um, and it, as it turns out, um, pollinators are actually a really good indicator for the health of an ecosystem. If you have healthy pollinators, the chances are that you have a healthy ecosystem too, because these animals and these insects are really linked to e these animals and the plants are linked to each other. So a lot of the times they've co-evolved and their health really reflects um, the other. So now Renee is going to talk a little bit more about pollination and why these guys are so important. Hi everybody. So pollinators in the habitats that they exist in are often called a keystone species. So that means that they are actually critical in the environments and the ecosystems that they live in. Now pollinators uh, pollination is actually what ensures a healthy harvest and lots of plants and crops all around. So they are very important to have around, right? So we're going to talk about this a lot today. We've got to move a little backwards <laughs> for our tortoise coming through down here. Um, but pollinators are responsible for the production of actually one third of the crops in the United States and actually about uh, 20 billion dollars worth of annual revenue, so they uh, of, of products that they produce. So they're really, really um, important for for our food production, right? Or or production of of materials that we use for clothing and things like that. But the problem with pollinators right now is that many pollinator populations are changing, and a lot of them are at, in fact declining. So the reason why many populations are declining is because of a loss of nesting sites and feeding sites. And this is because of chemicals that we're using, uh, like pesticides. It's, it, it's because of 
habitat degradation, habitat loss, where we're eliminating a lot of their habitats and the plants that they're using for feeding, for nesting, right? Um, a lot of it is, is due to pollution. So pollution, and then even some of it is due to climate change because it's changing a lot of their patterns and a lot of their behaviors, right? And they're not always able to find the plants that are important to them and around um, during a certain time that, that they may need. So in some areas, it's actually unknown what is happening to pollinator populations. They're fluctuating and they're changing, and this might be a little more worrisome if we don't even know what's happening because they are those keystone species and they're very important to us. So Kara's gonna talk to you a little bit about attracting pollinators because our, our mission at the end of this is to help pollinators, right? All right, so lots of things attract pollinators. Um, most of it is, for most pollinators, is actually the nectar of flowers. Um, so when they go up to a flower that smells really good, or maybe to us smells a little bit gross, um, they'll actually accidentally get pollen, maybe on their fur or on their, um, on their uh, really fuzzy bodies. Um, insects are the most common pollinators. So bees are, a, are, I think, the type of pollinator that most people think of when they think of a pollinator. And bees are really unique in that they pollinate on purpose. So they're going from flower to flower and drinking nectar, but they have to trap the pollen in their fuzzy bodies and on their legs so that they can bring it back to their babies or their larva and feed them. So what they will do is they'll make piles inside of their nests for their babies to eat the pollen. And that makes bees really great pollinators. They do it on purpose. They help us grow lots of different fruits and vegetables. Um, there are 450 species of bees in New York State, 4,000 species of bees in North America, but only one bee makes honey. I bet you guys know what bee makes honey, the honey bee. Um, but honey bees are not actually native to New York State, they're native to Asia and Europe. So they were brought here in the 1600s um, because of course people love honey. I know I love honey too. Um, but honeybees aren't actually the best pollinators for our environment. They're really good at pollinating where they're from. They actually have to visit 5 million flowers just to make a pint of honey, which is pretty crazy. So I have a little honeybee, um, if you guys can see that, the hive from a honeybee. And, um, but honeybees are still great pollinators. We still love them, um, but they are not a native species here in New York. Um, bees though are really important like we were saying if you guys can see this diagram of a bee they have dense hair like we were talking about um, and it's called scopa on their legs and abdomen that helps them trap the pollen and then a pollen basket on their leg right here and it's called a corbicula bees actually have five eyes that help them find um, flowers and nectar um, most bees are solitary, they live in the ground. Um, some only pollinate certain types of flowers, some pollinate lots of different flowers, but either way they help us a lot. They'll pollinate 90% um, of the apple crop. And you can learn to um, identify all different types of bees. You can get a handy guide like this one, um, and you can learn how to, to identify them in your backyard if you're interested. All you need is binoculars and a sunny day that's over 70 degrees. Um, and little winds, so that's really fun to do. A lot of people get confused between bees and wasps, and wasps are um, related to bees. Bees actually evolved from wasps, but wasps are thinner, they're longer legged. You can tell the difference because they don't have any um, fuzz on their body or hair on their body. Wasps eat bugs, so they'll feed their babies insects. They don't really pollinate um, like bees do because they don't always rely on the nectar from flowers. Sometimes they will though, so. But wasps, um, you can check out, uh, this is, like we were saying, this is a wasp, um, bald-faced bald -faced wasp nest. And this is a common type of wasp that you might see. I, I bet you guys have seen this one all around Long Island as well. But bees are great, um, nothing to be afraid of for bees. They help us. Without bees, we wouldn't have uh, lots of fruit and vegetables that we enjoy. All right, so thank you guys. So I wanna talk about two other 
major species of pollinators. Um, so I think after bees, what comes to mind? Probably butterflies. But also, a little bit less appreciated, but still very cool, moths are also major pollinators. Um, so I want to mention two, I mean, everybody knows this guy. This is the monarch butterfly. So these butterflies are beautiful and they are really important pollinators um, and they are really vulnerable. Um, so monarch butterflies actually rely on one plant, the milkweed plant, for their reproductive cycle. So they lay their eggs exclusively on milkweed and they eat exclusively milkweed in their caterpillar stage. Um, so without milkweed, the monarch butterfly really can't reproduce. Um, and these butterflies, like we talked about in our migratory episode, they have an amazingly complex, multi-generational migration to Mexico that is annual. Um, so they're stopping over several times and laying eggs on milkweed. So if we don't have milkweed all along their migratory path, they're not going to complete their migration. So they are uniquely vulnerable. Um, and you see a lot of uh, species of insects and some animals like this where they're super duper specialized. And those super duper specialized animals, they are vulnerable to climate change. Even one degree can make a big impact on their health and their reproduction. Um, and they're also vulnerable, like Renee was saying, to habitat degradation. So it's really important to try to incorporate these plants back into the way we landscape, into our yards. And they're beautiful. Um, so if you wanna help monarchs, these guys, you can plant milkweed in your yard. Um, but they also, as adults, eat nectar from many flowers. So if you have a, a garden with milkweed in it and some nice, broad, flat-based flowers, you'll definitely see monarchs this season. Um, I wanna mention another butterfly that's common around here, um, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Now these are beautiful, large butterflies and they are great pollinators of trees. Um, so often they'll favor birch, alder, cherry, and sweet bay magnolia trees, um, and they all have beautiful flowers. Um, so these guys are just gorgeous, gorgeous butterflies. Um, and they're called the swallowtail because you can see they have a really long elongation of the hind wing, and they're just beautiful. Um, one more cool thing about swallowtails though is that you can sometimes see uh, swallowtail butterflies in puddles alongside the road, in puddles you might not think they would want to drink out of, and that's actually because the nectar that they drink doesn't provide enough sodium for their needs. So they are attracted to those puddles because often, um, I've got a tortoise down here, <laughs> um, often those puddles have a high salt content from the roads. Um, so one crazy thing that they do. All right, so moths. I think moths do not get enough love. They are very cool. Um, so some moths like the Luna moth or the Cecropia moth are beautiful moths. But as adults, they actually don't have mouths to eat. So they're not really the best pollinators. So we're not gonna spend too much time on them. But one moth that is not only beautiful, but is a wonderful pollinator is the hummingbird clear wing moth. Now look at this guy. Is this not the cutest moth you've ever seen in your life? Um, so hummingbird clear wing moths, they are native to this area. Um, and they're pretty small. They're about 1.5 to 2.5 inches. Um, and they're called the hummingbird moth because when they fly, they hover and they kind of look like a hummingbird. So hummingbirds, as Renee is going to talk about in a little bit, they don't fly like a regular bird. So sometimes people mistake these moths for hummingbirds. Um, and so they're active mostly during the daytime and they're attracted to brightly colored flowers. Um, but they love bee balm, red clover, they'll often feed on blueberry bushes or cherry trees. So they're not that picky. They will eat, a, eat nectar from a lot of different plants. Um, so hummingbird clear wing, really cool. But there's another type of moth. So a hummingbird clear wing is a sphinx moth. And there's another one I wanna talk about. So that hummingbird moth is active during the day, but this guy, the Gordian Sphinx, or the Apple Sphinx, is actually a nocturnal pollinator. And they're really big. Their wingspan's actually about like three to five inches sometimes. Um, and these guys are super cool. They're called the Apple Sphinx, but they don't actually pollinate apple trees. That job is left to the bees. Um, so 
I don't know why that is, um, but they will pollinate a lot of the same plants as the hummingbird clearwing, but um, they like dogbane, evening primrose, phlox, and all of these are like native plants. So if you wanna have cool pollinators in your yard, a sure bet is to plant some native in there. Um, another cool fact about these guys is they are in like the hawk moth family and they're actually some of the fastest flying insects in the world and their speeds top out at about 31 miles per hour which is I think pretty awesome for something that is so so small um, so now that's about it for butterflies and moths um, and I am going to pass you over to Renee who's gonna talk about some other insects yeah. all right hello so I've got a couple really cool displays if you get a chance, when we open back up, you gotta come in our nature center because we have these beautiful displays. Um, someone donated their insect collection. So we've got lots of different bugs and I'm gonna talk about a few that are found in here, starting with beetles, because beetles are also really important pollinators. So I have an example of a beetle right here and there's actually one of these beetles. Let's see if I can find him in this camera on here. He is... Upside down. Where is he? I lost him. Ah, found him. <laughs> <laughs> this one right here. So you get a better picture of the size that he is, right? So this is called the elderberry borer. And elderberry borers, like other beetles, like scarab beetles, were around in prehistoric times. So they're really important at pollinating our ancient plant species. So beetles are really responsible for pollinating plants that have been around for millions of years. So these guys are great. We also have some very bee-like flies. So this looks just like a bee, doesn't it? This is actually called a hoover fly. And hoover flies resemble bees because that's a great way to protect themselves from predators. But even though they look like a bee, they cannot sting like a bee. So they confuse predators by mimicking their look. But you can see those big fly eyes up there, right? So that's how you know they're a fly. So these guys are important because they pollinate many of our wildflowers and many of our agricultural crops. And their larva, or their young, right? these guys actually will eat aphids and other pests, insects that are on crops. So these guys are great to have around because they're a natural pesticide, right? Another animal that resembles a bee is this little cutie right here. And this is called a bee fly or a bombolid fly. And they look just like a bumblebee. So their fuzzy bodies are really great because they can carry around a lot of pollen as they're moving from flower to flower drinking the nectar. So you can see these bodies as they're feeding get covered in pollen and so then they go to the next flower they bring all that pollen along with them. And in some places in the United States and in North America they're actually known to pollinate more flowers than bees. So these guys are really really great pollinators even better than bees in some areas. Amazing, right? All right, so another really important pollinator in different parts of the world are bats. Did you guys know that bats can be pollinators? Um, so mega bats, especially in the tropics, this is a specimen that we have inside the nature center that you can check out again when we open. Um, this is a flying fox and you guys may have heard of them. They're, um, they're, they look like actually a lot of people call them like little puppies with wings. Right? <laughs> they're really cute bats that are um, frugivores. They eat fruit. And I'm gonna pass this out so Mortis doesn't, our tortoise, um, <laughs> ruin him. But they're amazing pollinators all over the world. Um, the bats that we have on Long Island, they don't pollinate, they eat insects. So our native bats on Long Island, we have nine species. All of them eat insects, they eat mosquitoes, really important. But around the world, um, bats are super important um, vertebrate pollinators. And they pollinate 500 species of plants. This is a lesser nosed bat um, from Mexico and it is pollinating the agave plant. It's the sole pollinator of the agave plant. Without, um, without this bat, we would not have uh, great products that we get from the agave plant. So bats are really amazing. 
producing. Um, we should give them a lot of credit. They eat tons of insects. They help us pollinate as well. Um, for another pollinator, Renee is going to talk about hummingbirds, which is really exciting. All right, so everyone thinks of hummingbirds when they think of pollinators, right? So in the world, we have 325 species of hummingbirds. Within the United States, we actually only have eight different species. And in New York, we only have one. Does anybody know what that one is? The ruby-throated hummingbird, right? So ruby-throated hummingbird is a recognizable hummingbird, especially the males, because they have that iridescent ruby red patch on their chest. They have beautiful green backs. But ruby-throated hummingbirds are very, very small and they're super fast, so they might be hard to spot. They actually only weigh about less than an ounce, about the weight of a quarter or two and a half paper clips. That's a little bit easier of a way to kind of imagine what less than an ounce is. It's very, very small. So what's incredible though is that being so small, they actually consume half of their body weight in sugar or nectar each day. So they visit flower, hundreds of flowers a day, and they feed about five to eight times per day. And each time they're feeding from those flowers, they're pollinating them, right? So that's why they're very important. But what many people don't realize about hummingbirds is hummingbirds are actually omnivorous. So some ornithologists or scientists that study birds actually believe that hummingbirds, 60 to 80% of a hummingbird's diet is actually insects like spiders, um, small insects like gnats. So those things are what gives them a lot of their nutrition, but they have extremely high metabolisms um, and they move really fast. So they need the nectar in order to get quick energy. So they have to visit flowers, drink that sugar water and get nectar to provide them with the ability to sustain their flight, and their metabolism. So a lot of people like to attract hummingbirds. Now is the time that you want to be putting out those hummingbird feeders, be starting to plant for hummingbirds because hummingbirds will start to make their migration back here during late April and, and early May. So this is the time you wanna attract them to your yard. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to best do that. So one thing that you can do to attract them to your yard is put up a simple hummingbird feeder. A lot of people like to color the nectar in their hummingbird feeders. This is not actually great for them. So the best way to attract them to your hummingbird feeder is to have either a red color feeder or you'll notice on many hummingbird feeders that you purchase, the flower on the feeder that is where they sip the nectar out of is usually a red color. So that's all you need. What you can also do is you can tie ribbons, red ribbons in your yard. That way, as they're flying over through their migration, they might spot those red colors and come down to take a better look. That's a good way to attract them. And then planting. Kim was talking about planting native. Kara was talking about planting native. All of these animals evolved with the flowers and the plants that they use. So it is important to plant the plants that were around for them. Hummingbirds, Mortis <laughs> is chewing on my shoe right now. I don't know if you, you can see him like right behind me. <laughs> I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, hummingbirds have really good UV vision and color vision. Like I said, they're attracted primarily to the color red, but their long, to, their long bills can get into tubular shaped flowers. So those are good flowers to plant for them. I actually have a couple that are really good and native. So bee balm was one that Kim named too for some of the butterflies and moths, right? Cardinal flower, trumpet flower, trumpet honeysuckle, jewelweed. You may see jewelweed growing wild too. Um, red morning glory. Trumpet creeper, these are all great vines for them. Some of them are vines, you might notice. Some of them are, are more of uh, flowering plants. Um, so that's actually one way you can plant too for them is to actually plant a variety of flowers. So planting a variety of flowers that are actually going to bloom at different times is great because then you sustain their food all summer long. So that's great for them because you know they always have a reliable food source in your yard whatever month it is while they're here. The other thing is hummingbirds can be very territorial, especially males. So if you plant 
a large amount of flowers or usually at least two to three of each flower and then you can plant vertically too. So not only planting lower flowers but planting flowers that will grow along trellises and up higher. That way they have all sorts of different spots and, and niches in order to feed and kind of keep different spaces, different territories. You'll get a lot more hummingbirds that way. So and then of course planting native, planting flowers like these that they evolved with, right? All really good things. Um, I see some questions actually about if we have spots where you can buy plants. I think we, oh, at, at some yeah. point this week, yeah. we're gonna provide you guys with some really great resources on some local places that you can buy native. So that's a great question because we might tell you all these different things to do, but sometimes it's hard to figure out where to go to get these things, right? At the refuge, we do sell hummingbird feeders too. Um, so when we're open, hopefully we can provide you with that resource too. But um, hummingbirds are really, really great pollinator, right? So we're gonna close it up. Kim's gonna talk a little bit about how to help pollinators. Thank you, Renee. Renee is our resident hummingbird expert <laughs> and she actually teaches a program about hummingbirds too. Um, so I think we're like a broken record today when we say that planting native is one of the main ways that you can help poll pollinators. Um, and that is true. Um, and if you want to help monarchs, you can plant milkweed. Um, but so sometimes it can be hard to find native plants. And I will post for you guys a list of places where you can find them. Um, but also another great way to make sure that native is more accessible is to call your local garden centers and say, hey, I would love to buy native plants. I think you should carry them. Um, tell your friends about it um, because the more we ask for them, the more it's a good business strategy for places to carry natives. Um, so make sure that you check out your native garden centers and have a nice conversation with them about why they should carry them. Um, so that's one thing you can definitely do. Um, also, another really good thing to do is to protect the wild places that we have on Long Island and to support those organizations that protect our native landscape. Um, so the Quag Wildlife Refuge is one of them, but there are so many others. And a lot of the organizations that we're working with this week do amazing work protecting what native landscape we still have left. Um, so that is one thing you can definitely do. Another thing, and we wanna post instructions about how to do this, you can build a bee condo for our solitary bees. So this is an example of one. It's just a log with holes drilled into it and it's super easy and you can see there's a little place for you to affix it to a tree in your yard or in your garden. So it's something you can do at home with the kids and there are a lot of different ways you can do these. So easier ones where you have like hollowed out tubes that you tie together. So I'm gonna post that um, in just a little bit once we're done with this video. Um, and then another thing you can do, like Renee was saying, is put up nectar feeders for hummingbirds and butterflies, and you can actually make the nectar yourself. And it's really easy. If you were to just Google it, you can use household sugar. Um, and then finally, we want to say, um, we want to leave you with a conservation challenge. Everybody is doing yard work right now. Um, we're all trapped at home. It feels good to get outside. Um, so why don't you this season try to incorporate one native plant into your landscape. Um, it doesn't mean you have to rip out all your other flowers that you love, you have to get rid of your roses, um, but if you can try to incorporate one or two native plants, um, I guarantee you won't regret it and the pollinators that you will be seeing, beautiful butterflies, maybe hummingbirds, will make it all worthwhile. Um, and finally, I forgot to mention one thing is to lessen use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers um, because they really do have a negative effect on our pollinators over time. Um, sometimes you can't tell right away, and like Renee was saying, um, or Kara, that there's a lack of data on this stuff too. Um, so be sure, be, be mindful of what you use in your yard and know that it affects everything around us, including our pollinators and our water supply. Um, so that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope we leave you on a positive note um, about there's so much you can do on your own at home that really makes a big difference. And I think that's our main point that we're trying to send this week is that every little thing that we do, it, it, it piles up and it makes a huge impact. So just think about that when you feel overwhelmed sometimes. Um, so do we have any questions? about anything. Should we give a little tour? Oh yeah, as we, uh, and you can see what we've been dealing with these tours. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So as we're waiting for your questions, I'm gonna show you 
are tortoises that have been all over our feet. Hey, calm down. Here's, here's Mortis hiding under Kara's feet right now. <laughs> oh, and Redfoot. Any questions, anybody? Melon's hiding behind her little hideaway planter over there. And then I don't think you guys have met Spike. Spike's hiding in the corner. <laughs> He's a little Spike, yeah, today. Spike's a little more shy than the rest of our, our turtle friends. Oh, we're ending. They yeah, they, they, know. they only just settled down right now. All right. We do have questions? Okay. So we want to thank you guys for joining us today. Again, if you have any other questions about pollinators or planting a native, we're gonna provide you with a lot of different materials and continue watching all week because we're gonna provide you with lots of information. And even if you just take on one of these small lifestyle changes, you'll make a big difference, we promise. Thank you everybody, bye. bye. Say bye. bye. <laughs>